Welcome to Forum 360. This is Leslie Unger, your host today. Thank you for joining us for a different kind of addition to our global outlook with a local view. This is our, our first Zoom edition of Forum 360, and I welcome my two guests today, uh, current mayor of Maple Heights, Annette Blackwell, and past mayor of Richfield and current city director of Whitman, Bobby Bashira. Before COVID, when we heard any news that wasn't COVID, we heard a lot about the role of women in the 2020 election. We heard about the role of soccer moms, and we heard about the role of independents, and we heard about African-American women. We heard about women in the rural areas, women in urban areas. Today, I would like to look at women from a little different perspective. Women who hold elected office and what it is like to run for office. Uh, I want you to meet two of the women in the landscape of Northeast Ohio that make our, our landscape and our area uh, so uh, valuable and impactful. My first question goes to Mayor of Maple Heights, Annette Blackwell. How did you end up as mayor of a city in Northeast Ohio? Um, I believe it was my frustration. It was my apathy. Uh, I grew up in the inner city, just blocks from East Cleveland, which is one of the poorest cities in Northeast Ohio. And I moved to Maple Heights 20 some years ago, and they began to compare East Cleveland and Maple Heights. When cities turn dark, um, the belief is that it is no longer a desirable place to live, it's dirty, it's unsafe, it's poor. And I have found my dream home here. Um, I got what I wanted, skylights, uh, just a beautiful home, absolutely beautiful. But according to the people that were making decisions, it was in the wrong zip code. So I thought, do I move to another place or do I become what I knew then was a change agent and now I'm a change captain. And so I began to go to city council meetings. My daughter, who was in everything, she played the flute and we were in her mother's daughter's book club and she was president of student council. So I was involved in a lot with my daughter. I ended up becoming a parent academy coordinator and that was a grant program the schools had gotten to help parents become more engaged. Parent literacy, the importance of going to the progress book, the electronic report card, so you can be proactive rather than reactive. Uh, the importance of reading in the home, the importance of getting your child a library card. And so I, I taught that program for four years and we had a graduation annually, probably graduated over 200 parents over a four year period. And people kept saying, you should do more, you should do more. And every time I had a graduating class or a mom who was encouraged to go back to get her GED, near the end though, I had dads taking care of the children because mom were incarcerated or, or drug addicted. So the last two years, mostly dads in the class and everybody kept saying, you're our champion, you should do more, you should do more. And as the city slipped into fiscal emergency and disrepair and there was so much infighting with the current mayor at that time in council, I thought, well, I'll run for council. So I ran for council in 2013 for my district, district one, there's seven districts, did not win the election, but I won the primary, a person literally I worked in a county firm. I worked at Deloitte and Touche, a person that, and I taught this program. And I had an impressive win. I uh, ran against the incumbent and another gentleman, which I knocked out in the primary. And then the incumbent, who had never had anybody run against him, threatened me and basically said, who do you think you are? Nobody runs against me. Well, you know, you don't talk to a woman like that, right? I'm going to show you who I am. So I had him shaking his boots. I didn't win. But two years later, the mayor who I replaced said, you should run for mayor. And I go, mayor, I didn't even win my primary. He said, but you'll win for mayor. And I won for mayor. So, the first, the, so your second race and the first one you won was for mayor? Yes. Okay. I lost for council, came back, and I ran for council unsuccessfully in 13, came back 15 and won with over 68% of the votes, never had held elected office, and had a resounding historical win. Let's uh, see a uh, really interesting, interesting journey. Let's see what Bobby's journey was like as mayor of Richfield. Um, back when you were mayor when the Coliseum was still there? 
Uh, yes, uh, no, I wasn't. The Coliseum, the Coliseum was already gone. And that's in the township. That's we're, we're a village in a township. Village in township. Yeah. So tell us, like, you know, did, did a five-year-old Bobby say, gee, I want to be a mayor when I grow up? No, um, I wanted to be a mom of 10 kids. Um, I have two and a stepson, so I have three kids. No, uh, I, I was involved with student council when I was in high school, and I actually became a special ed teacher. So I taught special education uh, for a few years, and then I started my patients, Did the patients of, of working with students as a special ed teacher, did that come in handy as mayor? Absolutely. And not only with um, working with the students, but working with their parents. Yeah. So uh, I think I, I was at an advantage there. But in 1993, I believe, now it must have been be, I'm somewhere around there, um, the years get muddled a little bit. But when my daughter was six, uh, and a council person came to my house and said, they're going to be putting up a building two doors down from you and they're getting a variance and it's a business in a residential district. You should come to a council meeting. So I went to the council meetings, had no idea what I was getting myself into. I was pretty emotional. You know, it turned out fine at the end, but it was pretty emotional at that time. And the councilman and I um, became friends. And when there was an opening on council, they wanted to appoint somebody, and he said, "You should. we should look at you to be appointed. They interviewed 10 of us, and they ended up picking me, but I don't think they picked me because they thought I would be the best. I think they picked me because they thought I might be um, the easiest to work with. Well, they were wrong, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but I really looked into things once I got appointed. And, um, you know, as in many small towns, sometimes you start out with, just the core of who's always going to run for office, and it's usually men. So I was the only female uh, for a term, and then another female ran, and she won. So uh, at least there was always one or two women on council with me. Years later, I ran again, and I, and I, and I won, and then I ran another time, and I won. I sat out two years, ran again. Um, I think I lost that time, and then I was appointed back on to fill another vacancy, and that's how kind of how with a net that's what happens so at that time I decided I was looking around at what did the town need it needed uh, more touches it needed um, somebody more compassionate and I didn't feel the current mayors previous to me other than June Fiber had the compassion and I decided to run against an incumbent <clears throat> excuse me and as you know running against an incumbent is very difficult uh, I only lost by 10%, so I wasn't discouraged. I stayed on council. Four years later, I ran again when his seat was up. I ran against four men, and um, all involved with politics. A uh, fire chief, another assistant fire chief who was on council, a councilman who just got his master's in public administration, a former mayor who was our current economic development director. So imagine what my world was like at that time. And I beat all four of them, but there, there wasn't enough, there weren't enough votes between myself and the second place um, person who was the former mayor. And so we had to have a runoff in December of that year. And I literally ran again for a month, door to door, the whole, I did it all. And I won by five votes. So when they say every vote counts, I guarantee you every vote counts. Um, I ran that term. And then I ran my second term, and I, I beat the former mayor that I had lost to before I beat him by 300 votes. So I ran successfully those two terms. And I can tell you that being a female um, in, in the world of politics, and I'm not going to attest to it, we're treated much differently. So when you run for office, you really run. You run with all your heart, with everything that you have, and um, you, you don't hope that you get on the other side with that victory. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Thank you. Let me ask you, there are some people that say that it is harder for women to raise money as a candidate than it is for men. Um, what has your experience been? I, I would think that that's the very worst part of being a candidate is, is the, the continual raising of the money. Uh, but Annette, have you found that it is, is compared to what you hear from your male you know, um, cohorts, is it harder for women to raise money? It is because we're so nice and we're so polite and we're I can speak for me it's uncomfortable asking for money and coming from my background um, you know we were poor um, my family migrated here in the 60s I didn't come to Ohio 
until I was two years old in 64. I am from the most racist town around and there was a movie made about it, Selma, Alabama is where my family is from and where I'm from. But I got to the North because they still split, you know, split the country like the Civil War was never won on the North and the South. I came to the North as a two-year-old. And so we had a great deal of pride. You don't ask for anything, you make the best of it. If it's, if it's used clothes, you're, you, you, you we used to go buy our clothes by boxes and shaker heights, you know, and you have the fanciest dress, but you, you press it. And so that pride for me coming from such a poor family um, is, is asking for money. It's very uncomfortable, but I will tell you that people are very generous. When you get the courage, that's been my experience. You get the courage to ask for it. Um, they've been very generous. Bobby, how, uh, tell us what it's like to, to raise money and, and have you found that to be a difficult part of running for office? I think it is the hardest part, um, as Annette said, and, you know, I came from a middle class background, but my parents came, my, you know, part of the depression and they didn't have any money and you don't ask people for money. You, you get what you get, you wear hand-me-downs, the same thing, only it skipped a generation with me. But when I ran for mayor, I was a widow. So I didn't have any money. I didn't have my own money to put into the race. And the hardest part was going door to door. But, but like Annette said, people are very generous and it was very surprising. And maybe they would donate instead of money, I'm gonna donate all the stamps you need or I'll, I'll donate this or I'll donate my time, I'll put up your signs. So when you're, when you're in this, you're, you get very creative. And unlike Annette, I had run before, so I had known what do you do, how do you ask for money, and, and who can you count on. Um, and it, it, is, it is a really hard thing to do, but I got more comfortable doing it. This last time I ran for council, oh, that also, um, Leslie, I'm on Richfield Village Council because I ran in November when my term was up, not knowing where I was going to land. And so I'm still a council person. This last time, I, ra I raised no money. I spent my own money because of just what Annette was saying, it is a little it's difficult to go out there and ask. Now, there are some that say that because party leaders often identify, you know, next generation candidates um, and party leaders are often male, that they're often identifying males as, as people to encourage. You know, what did you find as far as encouragement from people that were already in office, um, Annette? Actually, the previous mayor sought me out because of my what I had done in the schools, a lot of people thought I should have ran for the school board because of what I was doing with the parents. Um, but the previous mayor was very impressed with the, the, the way I ran for council. My property tax background, having worked at Deloitte, you know, one of the largest accounting firms, although I'm not an accountant, but I had an understanding of numbers. Um, my professionalism, you know, we hate to brag a little bit, but you know, you always hate this. You can take it two ways as racist or sex. And people say you speak well. What does that mean? You know, you go, hmm. So for a black person, I speak well. But hey, it, it, if it goes with the territory, whatever. And so I thought my presentation, but I spent years at Deloitte making presentations in front of a lot of people to, to, to uh, wait, there's something here showing up. Oh, halfway. Yeah. Um, uh, making presentations. I'm very comfortable making presentations. And so it was actually the previous mayor that sought me out. No one cared about my race or sex initially because Maple Heights was broken. And the city was about, which had been historically Italian, Slovenian, Polish, had now been about 65% African American. And it was said the next mayor would probably be an African American. Yeah, I, that tr proven to be true but I had a lot of support and people didn't really care. They just wanted somebody they thought could save Maple Heights and fix it. So my, my position was unique is because of the horrible place Maple Heights. And they said, we'll try anything, you know? And so this woman has a background. She understands numbers. She can speak the English language. She's articulate. She's likable. She's got a relationship with parents. She may be a, a good bet. So I had a lot of support. What kind of support did you have from established people in, in elected office? So I, I believe that um, I didn't have I didn't have the support from the people that have been here a long time, grew up here, uh, became very uh, active in the community, and I don't want to use the term good old, but it was definitely a, a, a good old mentality. So I didn't have their support, which was really important to have, obviously, to in, in a small town. We're only a town of 3,600, and that number hasn't changed in years. So I didn't have that kind of support, so I had to look for new support. 
uh, the newer people on council, uh, the newer people in the community, I, and my friends. That's where I received the support, but I did not receive it from those that were already in office that had been in office. They, they found me uh, to be a distraction because what does she know? Um, they found me to be not, they didn't think I was smart enough to do the job without ever saying it. It was always implied. Um, so I had to fight my way, which I've done for you know many years, fighting my way through you know, being a widow since my youngest was a one year old and she's 20, almost 25 now. Um, so I've always had to fight my way. So it, it doesn't, it hurt, it stung. I think stung is the word, but I was able to find the new, the new people that, um, not so much even new in town, but were tired of the old way of politics in Richfield, even though Richfield's always been a great community from the day I moved in. Um, that was their perception. And then when I was pretty much ignored from those same people, I knew that I had to make my own way. And I did. And, and it still carries on. So I've got a, a great relationship. Um, and some of the people that are part of the um, older network as far as living here, I now have a better relationship with them. So I think over the years, you kind of, you grow into each other and you understand better what, that I'm really not that person. I'm, I'm, I'm smart enough to run a, a, a village. We were the number one community three years out of my eight years as mayor. Our income tax collections went up by 30%. I obviously knew how to do it, but I think they were afraid that I wouldn't, I wouldn't know how to do it. So. Um, it was it was quite interesting, but now I'm on council with two former mayors. Today we are looking at women in elected office, and we are looking at it with the mayor of Maple Heights, Annette Blackwell, and the former mayor of Richfield and current uh, director, uh, service director at Ritman, uh, Bobby City Bichette. Manager. I'm sorry? City manager. City manager, I'm sorry. City manager, uh, Bobby Bashira. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me ask you, there, there are some people that say that women are more scrutinized in, in their, their private life and for more private decisions like what they wear or who's watching the kids. Um, you know, the kind of joke is nobody asks Bill Gates, although he's not in election office, but he's a public figure. Nobody asks him who's watching the kids. Um, I know you can't compare it as a man, but Annette, do you think that the scrutiny you get is any different than the scrutiny that a male gets in office? Oh, yeah. I've never experienced so much sexism in my life. I thought it would be racism um, after the city's, city's um, been in existence for 100 years. They celebrated the centennial in 2015. So I'm the first woman and I'm the first African American. So they got a woman and a person of color ever. So I was going to be scrutinized on my race. Did I speak well enough? Was I too dark or was I just dark enough? Um, and so I knew that, and I thought my biggest challenge would be racism, but it isn't. Um, it is sexism. Uh, I found that most people don't really care what I look like as long as there's trash is picked up and potholes are filled and the police come, you know, when there's danger and the ambulance shows up with someone's fallen and can't get up. My race has not been an issue. It's my sex. People care what my hair looks like. Um, they care if I wear it curly, like natural and don't straighten it. They're like, what's going on with your hair? They care about the lipstick I wear. They love my shoes. When I walk in a council meeting, I am from head to toe. I am taken in. What am I wearing? What are my shoes? You know, what does she look like? Uh, I from a, come from a corporate background. So I have a ridiculous wardrobe from, from those days, but I am judged a lot on how I look, the tone of my voice. If I am annoyed or upset about something at council, many people say, oh my God, she lost it. I didn't lose it. I just got very emphatic and just sometimes disgusted by behavior of, of council or, or something a, a resident may say at the podium that's completely untrue. Or my one of my directors making a report and they missed an important thing or they said something that may be misconstrued. And so, but if, if the, even, like I said, the inflections in my voice, I'm, I'm judged on that. Oh, she was really upset. Oh, she lost it. Um, so I'm not allowed to get angry. Um, so I am judged on the, the, how my hair, is my hair natural? Because that's a big issue. Women professional, do black women wear their hair natural, kinky, curly, or do they wear it straight? My hair was kinky, curly when I ran for office. I was asked to straighten it. My daughter had a fit. I was a sellout but I'm okay with it. So I straightened it. 
I don't know if I'll go back to, I don't call it kinky curly. It's just natural. I don't know if I'll go back to that, but to be more acceptable, um, I did at the advice of some campaign people, I did straighten it. Um, so I'm conscious of my hair. It's perfect when I go into a meeting usually. Um, and I'm conscious to dress like the, attra being attractive, whether you're attractive or not, you better darn well try to look attractive. People, even we know it's proven and in interview people, more attractive people get the job. So I try to be well, I don't want to use the word attract. I try to be well presenting. I want to look like the mayor when I walk in a room because I'm judged if I don't. So I'm careful of the shoes, my jewelry. I'm very conscious of it. But we are judged on how we look, how we sound, and how we make decisions. Oh, you know, when I think about it, I want flowers at City Hall. When I got there, there were no flowers. Oh, that, that would be something a woman would do. There was no pictures. The previous mayor had no pictures. I had everything matted and framed. I went back in historical and hung stuff like the first fire engine. So we're judged uh, about our decisions, the way we look, the way we talk, all of those things. And so it, the biggest challenge for me has been sexism. But I'll say this, and I'll, I'll turn it over to Bobby. But you know where the sexism comes from the most? The women in the room, not the men. I, was, I thought it would be the men. It is the women that are the most sexist. And that, is, and that is right. Bobby, of the, um, somewhere in these numbers might be a little bit different, but out of 48 Northeast Ohio mayors in one survey, nine were women. So you must have found yourself in a room with mostly men yes. often. Can you tell us um, what, what that was like? And if you found, as Annette found, did you find more sexism from women than you did from men? I, I believe, I, I absolutely, that is true. Um, my fellow mayors at the Mayor Association when I was a uh, mayor of Richfield in Summit County couldn't have been kinder. Uh, they, they treated me as an equal. Uh, I think that people that I would meet outside of there when they would say this is so-and-so and so-and-so and, -so, and this is Mayor Bashir would be, oh, you're the mayor? You're a woman. And, you know, I'm sure Annette has gotten that as well. But um, I think when, when Annette was, was saying about being at a council meeting and being, you know, you're, you're being emotional, whatever. I think women are more passionate, men are more emotional. And so it's our passion coming through. And uh, I think that's really important that men don't see that, but we know that it's our passion, the flowers, the touches, uh, everything that we do is to embrace everyone in our community. So I believe I also have been treated that way over and over. Uh, I made a comment on Dr. Amy's fan page. They were, they were saying, Dr. Amy for president. And I, was, I said, no, she doesn't want to do that, especially as a woman. And the women attacked me on that page. It has nothing to do with gender. I said, it has everything to do with gender, how we're treated. So um, I think that it's getting a little bit better, but sexism is definitely still an issue. And that's why you don't see as many women in politics. And then whenever there's something that's going on locally or regionally or nationally, it's against uh, women, women who are in office. So we have to stay strong, stay firm, keep, keep doing it and show our daughters that um, we can, we can run communities, we can do it and uh, everyone can get behind us if they choose to. Let's take a, a quick look at your communities. Um, Annette, what is one thing that you would want people to know about Maple Heights? Maybe one thing that's distinctive, that differentiates you. What is one thing you'd want people that maybe they go past it on 271? Maybe they haven't been there or they've driven through it. What's one thing you'd like people to know? It is actually small town living. Uh, although we're 23,000, we're a very big city. Uh, 5.4 square miles, but 23,000 people. This was post-World War II, little bungalows lined up, but there's a small town, they're feeling here. There's a farmer's market, there's a true value. Everybody knows everyone at the local KFC or Mr. Chicken. Um, most of the lots are 45 by 120 on the east side. There's two sides of Maple. There's east and west side. West side, a little bit bigger, more affluent, 65 by 140 but very close knit. I don't think people realize that the there are neighborhoods and the pride, there is significant pride in Maple Heights. Um, in, a, in a word or two, pick Richfield or Rittman. Which, um, which one would you like us to know? I'm gonna choose, choose Rittman because I'm currently the city manager and I, I wanna give them a shout out. What is something distinctive that we might not know about Rittman? About, uh, I'm not gonna say it right, uh, Bauman's Apple Orchard 
is in Ripman, and I don't think people realize that. And it's a great, great place to go. Our democratic process depends on candidates running for office. Today, we have had the opportunity and the honor of two, uh, the mayor of Maple Heights, Annette Blackwell, and the former mayor of Richfield, um, uh, Bobby Beshera, to tell us and guide us through the challenges and some of the wins of being a woman in elected office. This is Leslie Unger. Thank you for joining us for our Global Outlook with a Local View, our Zoom edition. Thank you. Forum 360 is brought to you by John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, the Akron Community Foundation, Hudson Community Television, the Rubber City Radio Group, Shaw Jewish Community Center of Akron, Blue Green, Electric Impulse Communications, and Forum 360 supporters.